This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Good morning and welcome to day two of Politico's Competitive Europe Summit. I'm Eva White and I'm Politico's Technology and Competition Editor. Thank you all for joining today, both online and in person. If you listened in yesterday, you'll have heard us discuss the European economy, Europe's recovery plan and efforts to get innovation going. Today, we're going to drill deeper into climate, into competition policy and into... Uh, and these are very challenging times when Europe's values and aims are under pressure from a rapidly changing geopolitical landscape. In the last few months, as we crawl out of our home offices, we're witnessing a brutal war, we're seeing soaring prices, shortages for some must-have items, and just today, the most shocking thing of all, sunshine in Brussels. I like the sunshine, but we can worry too about record high heat temperatures, about unseasonal storms in parts of the world. With all of these problems in front of us, there are very strong opinions on what the right way forward should be, about what Europe we want to see, what price should we pay for the Green Deal, how far can or should climate policy go, what kind of trading relationships do we want, are we really naive to be open, what's the right way to help European industry, where does Europe's powerful competition policy fit into these new challenges, how do we deal with the giants of big tech and how do we get the chips and resources we need to become smarter and greener. Today, you'll hear lots of questions from our ACE team of Politico reporters who cover every move in EU competition, trade, technology and climate. And we hope you hear lots of interesting answers from the many policymakers, thinkers and doers who are grappling with these issues. First of all, I'd like to thank our presenting partners, Generali, Google, Yara and the European Roundtable for Industry and our knowledge partner, McKinsey Global Institute, for making this event possible. Before we kick off, a few housekeeping rules. You'll have the swap card platform, which you will see on your website. Uh, you, can, you can ask questions. This is the only way that you can ask questions. If you're already on the platform, feel free to chat with fellow attendees and ask questions in the question box to the right of the screen if you're on a desktop and below the live stream if you're viewing on your mobile. If you're joining us here in the hall, Politico Live has provided you with flyers on how to use our swap card platform and ask questions. We love debate, so please tweet what you hear and what you think of it using the hashtag political competition. And now let's get going. Today we'll be hearing from the EU's Executive Vice President for a Digital Age, Margrethe Vestager, who joins us via video link. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. It's so good to see you and what an exquisite pronunciation of my name. Oh, Kudos. thank you. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of time to practice. <laughs> we have to work on our Danish, though. It's, a, it's not an easy language. Well, you should, if you see Borgen in the original uh, version, I, it, will, it will take at least some, some time to get there. <laughs> We're glad to be able to hold events after so long in isolation. What did Corona mean for you? What kind of things did you have to delay doing in the early part of this mandate? Oh, if, if only, uh, I'd almost said, uh, because uh, what I've been, been, been looking at are, are teams that are really, really pushing through. Uh, you know, I think for us, uh, productivity went up, uh, so many murders, but of course, uh, most striking, I think by now 1,200 decisions for uh, help for businesses who were affected by Corona. And yet at the same time, you know, pushing through our legislative uh, agenda, uh, the DMA uh, in particular, the to Markets Act, uh, now the Parliament and, and Council are are doing the formalities after the political agreement so that we still uh, do hope that it will be in the official journal by October. So maybe if we uh, work hard, we will have compliance by early spring 24. I mean, that's one of the big successes of the last few months. I mean, it's been, the Digital Markets Act went through relatively fast in Brussels terms. What are you doing now to get ready for it? 
Well, first and, and foremost, we encourage uh, anyone who think that they are a potential gatekeeper uh, to come talk to us so that they can get prepared. And, uh, and then we're in the process of, uh, of setting up our internal uh, organization uh, in order to be able to manage this. Uh, of course, it will take some time before the first notifications they come in, so we still have time to go. But we keep an open door policy uh, in order for uh, potential gatekeepers to, to have time to prepare because the DMA will, will change some of the fundamentals uh, of how you do business uh, if you're designated a gatekeeper. On your side, what kind of skills do you need to gain? How many staff do you plan to add? How does DigiComp change to cope with the DMA? Well, uh, to some degree, you know, we can draw on, uh, on the experience that we have had from competition cases. Uh, you know, not one, not two, but three Google cases done, one still in the making, two Amazon cases done, uh, more in the making, the Apple cases we have right now. You know, we kind of know the behavior. We've seen it uh, before. Uh, but of course, we need uh, more people uh, to come on board uh, because this will be a lot of work. Uh, how many, uh, I cannot tell you now, but uh, I'm absolutely certain that we will be there when, when it's needed. Do you expect a lot of challenges from companies that they might litigate to, to prevent the DMA hitting them very hard? Well, I, I think that may be different from, from company to company. Uh, even though we talk about big tech as one of the same thing, they are different. They have a different uh, organizational uh, business culture. So I think it remains to be seen. But um, of course, it's important for us that the DMA has real effects. Uh, and, and I would think that in a number of, of boardrooms right now, uh, there are considerations uh, as to assess is this the, the turn of the tide? I, I do think so. This is the turn of the tide because you see legislation that has some of the similar sort of ideas to it in, in South Korea, in Japan, in Australia, uh, obviously uh, pushing very hard uh, in the US, um, uh, in Klobuchar, Celine, uh, others. So things are changing. And, and I think if, if that is realized uh, in boardrooms, then, uh, then of course, uh, compliance will be, I think, top pr priority rather than, uh, uh, than litigation. Another big project that you have, which is not tech necessarily, is the IPCIs, the important projects of common European interest. I mean, we're seeing these being prepared right now, and they're, they're big money. There's an awful lot of, we're hearing of billions of euros for some of these. Um, what kind of projects would you refuse? What, where should this public money go, and where shouldn't it go? Well, first and foremost, one of the, the benefits of, uh, of what we do is that we can keep uh, public money to the absolute uh, necessary. Uh, in some of the first IPCIs, they were, we're talking about uh, a, a reduction of, uh, of the notified aid between 30 and 40 percent. Uh, so in one of the recent uh, IPCIs, 1.7 billion euros uh, that taxpayers did not have to put in while every project uh, was still uh, uh, going to happen. Um, so I think it's really important work because at, at the same time, we can make sure that only the necessary aid is being given, that it's proportional to the private investment and that it's given in a, in a way that's appropriate. And, and what is important is, of course, that we fix market failure. And uh, one of the obvious market failures is that we do not necessarily see high risk, cutting edge innovation in semiconductors, in, in batteries, in, in hydrogen. And, uh, and if member states, quite many member states and many businesses can come together and produce cutting edge innovation with a full spill over uh, to the rest of the economy and the sector, then I think we achieve something really, really positive. Are these difficult projects for you to check? I mean, is it something that takes a long time? I, I understand from the company point of view that they want to see lots of money very fast. How do you answer that you will try and get this done in an appropriate time scale? Well, who wouldn't like that? Uh, a lot of money very fast. Um, uh, of course, I understand the impatience. Um, also because uh, I do think that a lot of these companies, they are in it, you know, for real. Uh, one of the reasons why I 
I'm still somewhat optimistic in our ability to fight climate change is that now it's the industrial uh, agenda, uh, the goals, uh, the ambitions has been adopted uh, by industry. So I do understand why they want to get uh, started, but everything depends on, on the data that we get, the information. Can we get uh, enough information to assess it? And we will draw on, on colleagues uh, all over the commission also with the necessary uh, factual knowledge in, in hydrogen and in semiconductors uh, in order to be able to do a highly qualified uh, assessment of the data that we're presented with. But, you know, sometimes we meet uh, projects where uh, support is, is being sought for uh, just to build a, a brick and mortar, you know, put bricks upon each other. That is not cutting edge innovation. We've had a project uh, where there was no funding gap. It was profitable in itself, so, so no re need for, for a, a subsidy here. Uh, we have found uh, projects that would be better assessed uh, under the uh, climate change uh, state aid uh, rules. So what is important for us is this very close cooperation, not only with member states, but also with the businesses so that they see what is the process, what is needed. And of course, we try to learn uh, and to be clearer so that they can better sort of assess what are the steps and how long will it take. Another big topic for us today at this conference is the economy. Do you notice inflation? Where do you see prices going up? Oh, I see, I see that everywhere. I see that on my electricity bill. Uh, I see that uh, by the pump. Uh, I see it when I go shopping. Uh, no matter where I do my shopping, I see that prices are coming up. Uh, to different degrees, it's not the same everywhere. If I compare uh, doing my daily shopping here in Brussels and, and doing it in Copenhagen, you know, inflation is not the same uh, all over Europe. Um, and, and for me, with, with my salary, obviously, I can, I can easily cope. But of course, I do worry for families uh, on a very tight uh, budget, uh, especially if you have to commute by car. Uh, that can be really difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with the recommendations uh, by the Commission for member states to focus their support uh, on uh, people in, in a vulnerable situation when it comes to, to being able to cope with the price increases. You've talked about wanting to dive deeper into inflation, into making markets work for people. What are you planning? Well, uh, we would, uh, of course, uh, hope that people see that the work we do um, in antitrust, in murder control, in state aid, in general sort of uh, keeps prices down because they make sure that there is a competitive pressure, uh, that you cannot hide yourself uh, under in the, the guise of inflation and, and get the extra uh, top off uh, now. But that is sort of a long term fundamental benefit uh, in our economy. Uh, the inflationary pressure that we have right now is not caused of lack of competition, it's caused of a number of, uh, of other things. So we cannot directly do something about it, but of course we should stay vigilant uh, to make sure that, that we don't have sort of uh, collusion under the, the guise, uh, disguise of, uh, of inflation. Uh, and here, of course, the national competition authorities, uh, they will have a very important task because they are very close uh, to the markets where people see it in their daily shopping, uh, by the pump, uh, in their daily necessities. I mean, we're seeing politicians in Germany and the UK irritated that the fuel tax cuts that they have suggested already haven't really worked. I mean, it's even been a few weeks, but the level of pain is quite real. And they're asking antitrust authorities to do something. Do you have any concerns when you hear politicians make those requests to antitrust authorities? Well, I completely understand their frustration. Uh, because uh, if you want to do something, uh, you want to see something happen. You know, I was driving through France a couple of uh, months ago, and here by the pump, you had the sticker uh, that uh, the government has enabled uh, the price to go, go down. So, of course, you want people to see the, what the visibility that actually there is, a, there is something being done here, action is being taken. So I understand the, the, the frustration and, and the need to do something. And I'm absolutely certain that the national competition authorities, they will look into this, but they will do that on a factual basis. Uh, you know, with the, with the latest legislation, again, we have ensured their independence. Uh, and it's really important, uh, of course, that their, their, their work is, is based on what they see on ground. 
Do you see any suspicions that there might be cartels increasing prices in this area? Well, from a sort of pan-European uh, viewpoint, uh, we can't see it, uh, and I, I wouldn't know. I haven't, I haven't read the books of, uh, of the national competition authorities. Would you see something that the? Uh, so we have a question from the audience here. Do you have a question? Could you see that the EU might do something? I mean, buying gas and petrol centrally yourselves and, and helping that way. Well. We are in the process of, uh, of setting up a uh, common purchase of, uh, of gas. Uh, it's the, my, my colleague, Katrin uh, Simpson, who is responsible for that in order to sort of muster up uh, the buyer's power of, uh, of the members of the European Union. Uh, I think that is an excellent uh, idea because in, in doing that, of course, it's likely that you can get a better deal in a very difficult uh, market, uh, trying to diversify our, our gas um, uh, supplies uh, and, of course, uh, getting rid of, uh, of the dependence of Russian gas. So I think getting together and doing something in common in, in such a difficult market, that is a good idea. We've had an extraordinary period where we've had, as, as you talked about earlier, the massive amounts of state aid going into the economy. Are we all state aid junkies now? I mean, we've moved from one type of state aid to another. We are seeing the Ukraine programs being passed. Do you worry about the long term effects of companies in some ways becoming addicted to, to aid at these levels? Well, I, I, I think the, the effect that one should look for may be even more fundamental, uh, because now we are, we are ending the uh, temporary state aid framework for, for COVID. Uh, we have the temporary crisis framework to deal with the effects of the war uh, that is uh, ongoing in Europe. Um, but the deeper effect may be sort of the state being more ambitious. Uh, because during the pandemic, you know, all of a sudden the state realized, I can make people stay at home. I can close businesses. Um, and that in combination with the fact that um, pushing through uh, our fight against climate change take a lot of efforts by our political system. So, so we, have, uh, we have a state, we have governments who take responsibility at a completely different level now than five years ago. So what is important is, of course, that that still sort of uh, built on the fundamentals that we need sort of our social market economy to work for that drive to come through, because there's no public funding uh, in this world uh, that will enable us to fight climate change. No public funding in this world will enable us to be uh, independent from Russian gas. We really, really need private investment. So uh, I think it's, it's a very important discussion we are having right now about state responsibility versus business responsibility. Uh, take the discussions we have about uh, raw materials, uh, the dependencies that we have uh, on a number of raw materials, uh, now eager in the process of, of finding uh, out how it and where it could be mined uh, in Europe and with friends, those dependencies, they were not created uh, in, in the Compet Council or, or in a political gathering. Uh, they were created by boardroom decisions. So, of course, it's important that the, the political system doesn't take over a responsibility that is rightfully a business responsibility to reconsider. Uh, should we continue just in time? Should we continue to go with little or, or no uh, storage? Uh, or should we reconsider our supply chains to make sure that we can better fend for ourselves uh, in a crisis situation? We couldn't help notice that when you talk about raw materials, you, you talk about this as, as a, an open subject still to be discussed, where Thierry Breton has said several times he wants to see legislation. Uh, how do you deal with disagreements between commissioners? We also saw recently a vote at the commission. I, I know it's something that is supposed to be secret, but where the, the recovery fund was something that you and other commissioners voted against. When commissioners don't agree, how do you sort this out? How do you deal with conflict? Well, I, I, I ne would never vote again the recovery funds. That, I think that is excellent. Uh, it was much more specific on, uh, on milestones on the Polish uh, Recovery and Resilience Plan. But I think one should appreciate uh, disagreements uh, because without disagreement, there's no way that, that we think about things. If it becomes, you know, just uh, sort of common knowledge, uh, everyone says the same, then maybe actually we may leave the facts behind and, and just keep going as if uh, everything was, uh, was a given. Uh, 
uh, I think discussions and, and disagreement uh, is the first very important steps to finding new and better solutions uh, and also to listen uh, to other people who bring something to the table. Um, also, uh, you know, I'm completely open uh, for legislation if there is a need. Uh, I hear a lot of businesses in Europe uh, a bit at on ease uh, about sort of the regulatory burden, uh, the things that are coming in, the reporting obligations, um, and and we have many tools in the toolbox. You know, it's it's not fresh in that respect. The, the European Union has a lot of legislation already. As a lot of tools in that toolbox, and it's important that we still see everything we got before we try to get new ones. I have a quick question for you on the antitrust side. Yesterday we saw the court uh, rule against the Qualcomm decision, a decision that you had signed. Do you feel disappointment when you see one of your decisions fail like that? And, and what are the next steps, or do you know right now, for that particular one? Oh, disappointment would be way too mild. You know, uh, losing his court is not something that you want to do. You try to do the, the cases in the best possible way so that they will stand up in court. So no disappointment is, is too mild. Uh, now we need to study the judgments uh, and figure out uh, what would be next steps. Um, but, you know, it is a, it's the fact of, of my life that sometimes you win in court and sometimes you lose. Uh, I don't think that can be prevented, even though, of course, I would like love to win every case. Um, you, you have done very well in getting so much of your legislation through already, through the Parliament and Council. There are still a few that are standing out there, like uh, the AI Act and the foreign subsidies proposals. How, which of those do you expect to see in the bag soon? Which of those do we really need to see sealed? What would you urge MEPs and, and Council to work on? Oh, I, I would hope that we could get the foreign subsidies uh, proposal, that we could get political agreements uh, on that uh, soon. And, uh, and of course, um, for, for the, the Data Governance Act uh, to really make sense, the Data Act uh, would be good to have on board. But one of the fundamentals, and, and this is a global new, uh, is of course the AI Act. Uh, and, and the reason why this sort of, what do you say, uh, suite of, uh, of legislation is important is of course that it should give muscle and body uh, to create trust in technology. That, uh, that we can get in control of the dark side in order to use technology in the best possible way, uh, among other things, uh, to fight climate change and to make more inclusive societies rather than the opposite. And, and the sooner the better, because of course it's really difficult to pass legislation. Often it's even more difficult uh, to make sure that it works on ground, implementing, enforcing it, uh, and of course, I would I would really like to see that we could have results uh, on ground before the end of this mandate, so that the members of the European Parliament can see and show their voters this is what we did. Thank you very much, Commissioner. It's been a pleasure yeah. having you again with us today. Next My time pleasure. in real, Thank in you. real, I hope. <laughs> yes, Thank I you. would love that. Thank you very much. Thank you. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from Simon van Dorp on competition. Europe's Agile tool. So if you don't mind staying in your seats for just a couple of minutes, we'll be right back. Thank you. This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. 